of Ulysses, uh, which as you probably know has been regarded by many people, including myself, as the blockbuster of the 20th century. Uh, in, in the year 2000, Random House uh, conducted a, a, a survey among uh, a select group of editors and then general readers as to what was the best novel written in English in the 20th century, and both lists came up with uh, Ulysses on the top. Uh, I've got a friend uh, in Switzerland who's in his 70s and who uh, now in his life only reads Joyce and Homer because he doesn't have time to waste on secondary figures like Shakespeare and so on and so forth. Uh, Ulysses broke the laws. Uh, if you buy a copy of the novel, you'll find in the front of it a brief from the federal court telling you that this book is okay to read. Not even Mein Kampf or the sayings of Chairman Mao comes with that kind of disclaimer. Um, because for 13 years in this country, you could not read Ulysses. And then in one week, after we got a New Deal president, you could drink a beer and read Ulysses at the same time. Okay, so Eliot uh, 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 showed up at Virginia Woolf's house with his hands trembling as he read Ulysses in installments saying that Joyce had uh, exposed the futility of all styles and destroyed his own future. Uh, Woolf paid jo Joyce the tribute of writing Mrs. Dalloway as a kind of a compliment to Ulysses. F. Scott Fitzgerald at a party in Paris uh, 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 told Joyce that if Joyce wanted him to, he would throw himself out of a three-story window. He was drunk. Uh, Joyce said, that's okay, you don't have to do that. And uh, Faulkner uh, talked about Ulysses as a writer's Bible. And uh, uh, a few brief words on the reading will do for next week. We start Faulkner, who's tortuously difficult, both because of his, uh, uh, style, uh, his syntactical style. Sentences will go on for pages. Uh, and uh, the narrative is also complex and tortuous. The story is not told straightforwardly. You get bits and pieces of it. And it's also a book that explores uh, Southern racist society, and so it's full of the N-word. Um, and uh, I just want to make you aware of these... Uh, these aspects of Faulkner. My advice would be to read it, read it slowly rather than fast. Uh, uh, enjoy the prose rather than trying to whip through it. Okay, so I realize I've thrown you into the deep end of the pool here by giving you a chapter of Ulysses uh, uh, from the middle of the book without giving you a context, but I think you can uh, draw a lot of inferences about what's going on in it just by reading it. So let's look at the first paragraph, uh, uh, which puts us right into the, in the middle of, of Mr. Leopold's Bloom's mind. We're looking at Dublin, Ireland, and in particular a candy store, looking through the window at different types of candy, pineapple rock, lemon pot, uh, plat, and butterscotch. And then the shop girl, a sugar sticky shop girl, uh, shovels scoopfuls of cream for a Christian brother. That would be a Catholic schoolboy. So you're seeing a boy in a candy stop uh, buying, uh, uh, buying fruit. Uh, and then it sees a sign on the candy store that this candy store are lozenge and comfit manager, uh, manufacturers to, to the king. Uh, so we're seeing Dublin, but as it's filtered through Bloom's eyes, uh, and then immediately, uh, one of several moments in the chapter that's puzzling and that I want to go through first before talking about the chapter generally. A somber YMCA young man, watchful among the warm, warm sweet fumes of graham lemons, placed the throwaway in the hand of you. Can you smell like the sticky sugar, uh, the kind of co cotton candy uh, or butterscotchy smell you get outside of candy stores, the warm sweet fumes? Um, he places a throwaway in Mr. Bloom's hand. Heart to heart talks? Look, me? No, uh, blood of the lamb. Slow, slow feet walked him riverward reading. Are you saved? All are washed in the blood of the lamb. God wants blood victim, birth, hymen, martyr, war, foundation of a building, sacrifice, kidney burnt offering, druid's altars. Elijah's coming. Dr. Ele John Alexander Dowie, restorer of the church in Zion, is coming, is coming, is coming. It's, uh, it's an evangelical uh, 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 Christian man uh, throwing out a flyer uh, advertising the uh, evangelical campaign of Alexander Dowie a real person, American, who founded the city of Zion, Illinois, and who conducted an evangelical crusade in Dublin in 1904. The confusion is that Bloom looks at the, at the, at the handout and sees the, word, the letters B-L-L-O-O -O and thinks it's his name, but it's actually the blood of the lamb, which leads to a kind of confusion between Bloom and the Messiah and raises the question for people who have been reading Ulysses from the beginning of whether or not Bloom can be the new Messiah. I'm going to table that question, uh, come back to it if there's time. But uh, that's a, 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 a difficult moment. And then on page 156, uh, uh, Mr. Bloom runs into somebody called Josie Breen, uh, who you, you, you gradually learn in the novel was the, the woman that Bloom was dating uh, as a young man before his wife met him, Molly. Uh, so it's his old girlfriend, and she's frumpy and married to this kind of lunatic who later in the book is said to be so stupid that he has to put his hat on with a shoehorn in the morning. Um, he's received an anonymous postcard from somebody that says on page 158, uh, UP, uh, it's, not, it's not even clear what it says. It, it, it might just say UP or UP up. Uh, and though it's anonymous, he doesn't know who's, who's uh, sent it. He's taking out a libel suit for 10,000 pounds. 
He's uh, uh, Office Gord. So uh, uh, th the question is, like, what is it about this postcard that irritates Dennis Brain? And uh, there, have been there are 20 or 30 articles in the Joyce, uh, uh, Joyce trade that talk about how it might mean that Dennis Brain puts fingers up places where fingers were never meant to go, uh, how the jig is up with him, how he can't get it up anymore. It could mean UP, uh, you piss, you're no good. And then in Ireland, it turns out UP means underproof for, uh, uh, for like weekend whiskey, uh, not quite up to par. So I, I'm not going to make a decision about these many meanings, but it does raise the question if the letters U and P can generate so many conflicting readings, what do we do with the letters uh, uh, LE at the beginning of the chapter and lemon, uh, or any two letters in Ulysses? So it's a kind of invitation to uh, open the book and make it widely readable. Then on page uh, 154, there's a moment where Bloom, is it 154? Now, it's at the bottom of 166. Uh, actually, no, on 154, the word is mentioned, uh, parallax. It's toward the top of the page. In the first long paragraph, there's a Bloom is looking at a time ball that goes down on a pole on a building in the center of Dublin. Uh, time ball on the ballast office is down, Dunsink time. Fascinating little book that is of Sir Robert Ball's Parallax. He, Ball was the astronomer at the observatory, and he wrote a book uh, that mentions parallax. I never exactly understood. There's a priest. You could ask him. Pair? It's Greek, like parallel, parallax. Uh, Metempsychosis, she called it, till I told her about this transmigration. His wife has asked him to define the word metempsychosis earlier, and she's pronounced it metempsychosis. So he thinks about the word parallax here and doesn't know what it means, but he actually illustrates it on page 166 in the last paragraph. Um, he's standing in front of an optician's store. The optician had a, a, a sign out in front suspended in the shape of a pair of glasses. And in the last paragraph, he faced about and standing between the awnings, held out his right hand at arm's length toward the sun. Wanted to try that often. Yes, completely. The tip of his little finger blotted out the sun. Must be the focus of the raised cross. So he's doing this familiar game that we've all done where you uh, uh, close one eye and then block some, uh, I'm going to block the exit sign with my finger. I can't see it now. But if I close the open eye and open the closed eye, my finger jumps about a foot. You should try this millions of times every day. Um, what it illustrates is that you need two eyes to see anything or two perspectives. Uh, uh, and it's an important concept to a novel in which there are two main characters and in which meaning uh, is never finally arrived at, but uh, uh, is always kind of deferred. Uh, you get one point of view, and, and uh, Bloom is the Messiah, and then you look at it from the other point of view. No, he's not. He's just like a sad sack, a, 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 a pathetic middle-aged uh, Dubliner. Well, the truth must but lie some place in between, and then you take up that truth and build another one until you uh, uh, move in the process of generating meaning. Then there's a moment on page 176 uh, uh, where Bluma thinks about going to the museum after eating his lunch to see sta statues of naked goddesses. Uh, Ace digestion, they don't care what man looks, all to see, never speaking, I mean to fellows like Flynn. Suppose she did Pygmalion and Galatea, what would she say first? Mortal, put you in your proper place. Quaffing nectar at mess with gods, golden dishes, all ambrosial. Not like the tanner lunch we have. Boiled muttons, carrots, and turnips, bottle of allsop. Nectar. Imagine a drinking electricity. God's food. Lovely forms of woman, sculpt an onion. Immortal lovely. And we stuffing food in one hole and out behind. Food, child, blood, dung, earth, food. Have to feed it like stoking an engine. They have no... Never looked. Uh, I'll look today. Keeper won't see. Bend down, let something fall. See if she... You fill in the blank. Uh, has an a has an anus, uh, um, so this is Bloom's curiosity about the body, and also it's Joyce commenting on the difference between his realism and the realism of virtually anybody else you've read in Western literature. Uh, would you ever guess that people defecate if you uh, uh, read most of the most of the books uh, uh, that we've read? Um, that people have assholes. Uh, there's one part of this book where uh, Bloom sits on the on the toilet in the outhouse and. Uh, reads a Reader's Digest article while he's doing it. Uh, he reads two columns, which tells us he does two columns. Uh, it was a scene that really disturbed Virginia Woolf. Um, <laughs> and uh, Peter Walsh at the end of Mrs. Dalloway thinks how odd it is that now people are writing about water closets in little magazines. I, I think she's got Joyce in mind there. Anyway, uh, Joyce uh, uh, shows hu uh, humans in their entirety. Uh, they have the holes that the statues of the goddesses and other represented beings don't. Then finally, the last confusing moment is uh, page 183, the closing 
where the prose gets kind of staccato. Um, um, Mr. Bloom came to Kildare Street. First I must, library, straw hat and sunlight, tan shoes, turned up trousers. It is, it is. His heart quapped softly. To the right, museum, goddesses. He swerved to the right. Is it? Almost certain. Won't look. Wine in my face. Why did I? Too heady. Yes, it is. I'm to walk, not see, not see. What's happened here is that Bloom has run into a, a man named Blazers Boylan, um, who's going over to his house in the afternoon. He's a concert manager. He's going over to Bloom's house to practice a concert with his wife. But Bloom has got intimations that his wife is going to do the dirty deed with Blazers Boylan and cheat on him. It's, Bloom has gotten this news in the morning that Boylan is coming over. And throughout the day, he's uh, anguished by the prospect of his wife cheating on him and sleeping with another man. And so at the end of the chapter, you see his agitation as he's uh, trying to pretend he's not seeing this guy and is patting himself all over, pretending to look for something as if he's electrocuted. So those are the uh, difficult moments. And uh, let me, let me uh, run through the chapter more broadly now by asking what it accomplishes uh, uh, or what it tells us about Bloom and what you, sh you might have gained. Uh, for, w for one thing, uh, one of the first things you learn about Leopold Bloom on the first page in which he's presented is that he's uh, a person of kindness and curiosity. And I think we see a lot of his kindness in this chapter. This is one reason why it's possible to see Bloom as a messiah. Um, when Joyce was writing Ulysses, a friend of his would ask him uh, what he was doing. And, and Joyce would always say, uh, 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 what do you think of Bloom? And uh, the, the friend, Frank Budgeon, asked him what he meant to uh, portray in Bloom. And he said, a good man, uh, a difficult thing to do. So uh, Bloom's sympathy and kindness is immense. Uh, on page 151, he sees uh, Dilly Daedalus, uh, Stephen Daedalus' sister, and it's here that we learn that the Daedalus' mother had 15 children. She dies at f the age of 42 of uh, liver cancer after having given birth to 15 children, and he feels bad for her poverty. On page 153, he looks at the birds uh, uh, floating on the River Liffey, and he feels bad for them and buys them some food and uh, feeds them. On 154, he sees these uh, sandwich, these guys ad doing advertising, wearing sandwich boards, advertising a stationery store. And he feels sorry for them because they're like a minimum wage workers uh, eating on the run. On 155, he remembers going to collect uh, accounts at a nunnery. And he's, he, he expresses pathos for the nuns, uh, the women who go into nunneries uh, uh, and uh, uh, forsake their love life. Uh, he thinks that nuns invented barbed wire. Um, and then he meets on page uh, 158 Mrs. Breen, whom he feels terrible for because she used to be his girlfriend, but now she's uh, dressed up in, in shabby clothes, and she's married to this lunatic. Uh, uh, her life has, uh, has become a kind of hell. And she tells him also about Mrs. Purefoy, a mutual friend who's been in labor for three days, and uh, Bloom expresses compassion for her labor pains. At the end of the chapter, he helps a blind stripling across the street, and then looks in the paper and reads uh, that there was a boating disaster in the East River in New York, uh, a, 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 a ship that was carrying a group of uh, uh, a, con a church member is on a picnic, uh, caught on fire, and like 150 people died. Uh, and Bloom feels terrible for them. Uh, so we see a lot. We see that Bloom is not callous, and that he has a lot of sympathy for people. And you might think about sympathy, uh, feeling for somebody else, as a kind of emotional version of parallax, uh, looking at things from another perspective. Um, we also see a lot about Bloom's vulnerability. Uh, he's done what most people do when they get bad news. He's learned that his wife might be cheating on him and his first impulse is not to think about it or to pretend that it's not happening. And he's done that throughout the seven chapters preceding this. Uh, the, the moment at the end of the chapter tells you that he can't avoid boiling anymore. But there are other things that occur to him too, like this uh, kind of cryptic passage on page 153. He's crossing the, the River Liffey and uh, notices that somebody's put a boat out there with a little advertising sign in it. And he thinks about clever advertisements. Um, at the very bottom of the page, uh, McGinney, the dancing master, set up self-advertisement. This was a guy who used to walk around Dublin it dressed up in like scarlet and purple clothes to call attention to his dancing academy. Uh, self-advertisement. Got fellows to stick them up or stick them up himself, for that matter, on the QT, running in to loosen the button. Fly-by-night. Just the place, too. This is a men's room. Post no bills. Post 110 pills. Some chap with a dose burning him. So he seems he's thinking of some ad for uh, venereal disease treatment. Uh, and then this passage, uh, if he, oh, eh? No, 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 I don't believe it. He wouldn't surely. No, no. Mr. Bloom moved forward, raising his troubled eyes. Uh, and then he thinks about the word metempsychosis and of uh, his wife asking him for the definition. And he smiles. Uh, oh, rocks at two windows of the ballast office. She's right there after all. Uh, she's not exactly witty, can be rude. Uh, and you get to see Bloom's affection for his wife here. Uh, but that little segment of uh, no-nos 
uh, is Bloom thinking about the possibility that Boylan might have a, an STD? They had them in 1904, and if so, uh, there could be real, real consequences for his marriage. And then after he smiles at uh, Molly saying, oh, rocks, uh, on 155 he has a long memory of a outing they took to the Glen Creek, at the Glen Creek, at Glen Creek dinner. Um, um, never put a dress on her back like it, fitted her out like a glove, shoulder and hips, just beginning to plump it out. And then this phrase that recurs throughout the chapter, happy, happier then, snug little room that was with the red wallpaper. And he thinks about giving his daughter a bath. Um, the Blooms have been married for 16 years, and uh, the news you get is that 11 years ago they had a, a, a son who died in, uh, in, in the first uh, 11 days of his life. He was uh, stillborn. And since then, the Bloom's sex life has been uh, troubled. Uh, uh, as uh, Bloom puts it on page 168 uh, in this chapter, could never like it again after Rudy. Uh, it's the it's the fifth, fifth line down. I was happier then, or was that I? Uh, could never like it again after Rudy. So the, the Blooms were very happy in the early years of the marriage, and then after the the, the death of their son. Things seem to have gone uh, sour. And then at 150, uh, 156, he thinks about Mo when Molly coming, walking home from, with Molly from a concert. Uh, remember when we got home raking up the fire and frying up those pieces of, of lap of mutton for her supper with the chutney sauce she liked and the mulled rum? Could see her in the bedroom from the hearth unclamping the busk of her says. Swish and soft flop her stays made on the bed, always warm from her, always liked to let herself out, sitting there after till, till near two taking out her hairpins, newly tucked up in Betty House, happy, happy, that was the night. Um, so a lot of fond memories uh, of what he has to lose if he doesn't uh, do anything about this impending adultery. Um, he also thinks about Molly being pregnant on page 162 when he's thinking about Mrs. Purefoy. Um, and on 167, you get a little passage in which he recalls <coughs> seeing Molly and Bloom, Mo Molly and Boylan flirting with each other in his presence. Uh, this is one of the clues that tells you that uh, they're, they're carrying on. It's the middle paragraph on page 167. Wait, uh, the full moon was the night we were Sunday fortnight exactly. There is a new moon. There's a full moon on May 29th. So he's thinking about an outing that the three of them had on May 29th. Walking down by the Tolka. Not bad for a fair view moon. She was humming, in the words of the song. He, other side of her. Elbow, arm, he. More words of the song. Touch, fingers, asking, answer, yes. Stop, stop. If it was, it was, must. This is what he tends to do, is not think about this, because it, it causes him great pain. Um, and again, on page 182, today, today, not think. Uh, there's also, uh, is, is a sign of like how deep the attachment of Bloom and Molly is, a memory on page 175. The last, uh, uh, last paragraph on the page is preceded by a single sentence that says, stuck on the pain, two flies buzzed, stuck. Knowing a long description of uh, Molly and Bloom uh, walking on Hoth Head, a uh, 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 natural area outside of Dublin, uh, and he thinks about m uh, making love to her. And this is, uh, it turns out this is the, uh, the same moment that Molly Bloom is remembering at the very last page of the book when she says, yes, I said, yes, I will, yes. It's the day they, des they decided to get married. And after Bloom has this memory, me and me now, stuck the flies buzz. It's like he's watching flies copulating and comparing uh, uh, th that kind of love making to what their love was when they were uh, uh, at the start of their lives and very happy. Um, so you see, uh, we, we get in this chapter a deeper sense of like Bloom's attachment to Molly and the amount that he has to lose. Uh, um, and also at the end, uh, uh, it, it, it Bloom has run into Blazes Boylan once earlier uh, while he was driving in a carriage with some people to his, a funeral. And at that moment, everybody leans out to say hi to Boyle, and Bloom looks, looks at his fingernails, uh, uh, avoiding it. Um, at the end of this chapter, he can't avoid it. Uh, it it's like he's electrified by uh, patting himself all over. Um, and I think what Joyce is showing us is the way people react to a depressing and anxiety-provoking news, that people tend to block it out at first, today, today not think, uh, but gradually it surfaces. And by the end of this chapter, halfway through the book, I think the news that Bloom's marriage is in trouble has been digested, and he's got to deal with it. Now, I use the word digested deliberately uh, because, uh, uh, as you'll notice in the schema that Joyce wrote for Ulysses, uh, he said that the uh, style of the chapter was peristaltic. Uh, and what does that mean? Uh, 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 peristalsis, of course, is the, the, the uh, process of contraction of the muscle, muscles of the alimentary tract from the throat all the way down through the, uh, 
uh, to the stomach and through the intestines. It's the kind of like boa constrictor like movement that digests food. Um, and uh, the chapter is peristaltic in the sense that uh, uh, at one level I just punked you because uh, uh, I'm going to read all the passages I just read you and, and make them mean something different. They're going to be about food. So let's go back and read about the evangelical tract uh, on the first page. Um, after the italics uh, paying game, uh, polygamy, his wife will put a stopper on that. Where was that ad? Some Birmingham for the luminous crucifix? Our Savior, wake up in the dead of night and see him on the wall, hanging. Uh, Pepper's ghost idea, iron nails ran in. Phosphorus it must be done with. If you leave a bit of codfish, for instance, uh, I could see the bluey silver all over it. Nutty went down to the pantry in the kitchen. Don't like the smells in it, waiting to rush out. What was it she wanted? The Malaga raisins, thinking of Spain. Before Rudy was born, the phosphorescence, that bluey greeny, very good for the brain. Now, his, his mind is now like in the pantry, kind of r ruminating among the, the various available foodstuffs. And at this point, his attention is attracted by Stephen Dedalus' sister, Dilly, and he feels bad about her poverty, uh, but uh, also looks uh, with some judgmental severity on the church because the last two lines, uh, the church will eat you out of house and home. No families themselves to feed. They live on the fat of the land. Their butters and larders. I'd like to see them do the black fast Yom Kippur, cross buns, one meal in a collation for fear he'd collapse. And then he looks at, the, uh, at Dilly Dedalus. Uh, uh, good Lord, that poor child's dress is in flitter. Underfed she looks too. Potatoes and marge. Words and potatoes, so always back to food. Now, he crosses the bridge, goes over the River Liffey, the Liffey that runs to the center of Dublin, just as you crossed over Strawberry Creek today. Did you wonder what Strawberry Creek tasted like? Um, there was a period in your life when, uh, uh, I know you know the top of this table tastes like, because there was a period in your life when your knowing of the world was through your mouth. You, you, you negotiated on all fours, crawling on all fours, uh, picking up everything you could find, cinders, cigarette butts, uh, and putting into your mouth. Uh, top of this table, dusty, bitter, finally not palatable. So uh, Bloom, as he crosses the river, uh, thinks about somebody who jumped into the river and thinks, if I threw myself down, Ray Reuben J's son must have swallowed a good belly full of that sewage. So think about what a, a, a belly full of strawberry creek water would taste like, because Bloom does. Uh, and then he notices the gulls, uh, uh, the gulls. Uh, Joyce is now bringing to psyche out of mind by making us uh, conscious of things unconscious. Uh, uh, and it he, he gets this little uh, uh, qu a couple of poetry. Uh, the hungry famished gull flaps over the water stall. Now, when you read poems about birds, uh, what are they usually about? Joyce provides a contrast on page 166 when uh, Bloom sees two poets coming out of a vegetarian restaurant uh, and thinks about uh, poetry and thinks the dreamy cloudy gull waves over the waters dull. So that's the way poets usually write about birds. It's like creatures that can, can transcend the earth and take flight, like Shelley's Skylark or uh, Keats's Nightingale. Nobody thinks about the hunger of birds, as Bloom does back on page 152, the hungry famished doll. Keats would never have written that line. Uh, it's about the bird's hunger. And so Bloom buys, uh, first of all, he cr crumples up the evangelical tract and throws it into the water, and uh, the birds don't go for it because they're not suckered by literature the way humans are. They want food. And so Bloom buys them food and feeds them, uh, doing the equivalent of what Elijah does, uh, doing, doing better than what Elijah does in the Old Testament because Elijah is fed by birds who drop mana down onto him. Uh, Bloom is a better Messiah because he feeds the birds. Uh, uh <coughs> and then let's notice where his thoughts now go because they undergo a series of amplifications and inversions that uh, typify for me the, uh, the chapter. He starts, after having fed the birds and wondered about like what they eat, uh, his thought turns to... Uh, Swans from any, uh, let's see, uh, they live on fleshy fish, they have to, all seabirds, gulls, sea goose. Swans from Analithi swim down here sometimes to preen themselves. No accounting for tastes. I uh, wonder what kind of swan meat. Uh, Robinson Crusoe had to live on them. And then uh, next paragraph, uh, if you cram a turkey, say, on chestnut meal, it tastes like that. Eat pig like pig. Then why is it that saltwater fish are not salty? How is that? And then if you don't get it there, uh, also on page uh, one. 72 at the top. He thinks about Christmas turkeys and geese. So back on page 153, in short, he's like uh, started thinking about what the birds eat and then started to think about eating the birds. So this becomes a kind of like a, a natural cycle of hunger in which everything is turning into an ed edible plate, uh, 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 ed edible food. 
on page 170, there's a, a phrase I'll come back to, eat or be eaten. Um, and it's not until page 158 uh, when he's talking to Josie Brain um, that the phrase, I'm hungry, occurs. Uh, but once you start to think about it and go back to the first paragraph where Bloom is kind of uh, bathed in the smell of lemon candy uh, and then start to think about his pantry and uh, uh, that, that food is on his mind from the beginning. And look at what happens here when he's talking to Mrs. Breen on page 158. Uh, uh, they're standing outside of a bakery. Uh, flakes of pastry on the gusset of her dress. Dog of sugary flour stuck to her cheek. Do you ever, are you ever so hungry that when you look at people, you notice the particles of food that are stuck to their clothing, uh, as Bloom does here? And on the prior page, if you notice, when she opens her purse to take out the, uh, the, the postcard, a piece of candy falls out and Bloom's eye beelines for it. Uh, uh, he's being attentive to food. Um, so uh, food is never very far from the surface of this chapter, uh, just as it's not, not very far from the top of your mind right now that I've made it conscious. So uh, th this chapter is, 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 is uh, primarily about Bloom's uh, 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 sympathy, his kindness, his curiosity, but at the same time, beneath this uh, conscious surface, Joyce is making us aware uh, of a kind of unconscious. Uh, I'll go back to a sentence on page 151, the first page of the chapter. His slow feet walked him riverwards. Uh, reading, uh, a sentence that captures a sense of uh, aut autonomicness or involuntary motion, uh, the motion of the body of which the brain is not conscious. Uh, um, in, in, in short, the, the chapter is beginning to show us the unconscious unco impact of the body on the mind. Uh, and in particular, the, cap the cat chapter is giving us food for thought uh, uh, in exploring the importance of the belly and alimentation on thinking, uh, the way the, place the flesh plays into the head. So the chapter is, among other things, uh, uh, tearing apart 19th century dualisms between body, body and mind. You wouldn't have a mind if you didn't have a body and food to put into it. Uh, you'd be dead. Um, so the, the body is very much part of Bloom's thinking uh, throughout Ulysses and very much in this chapter. Um, it's where I think uh, Joyce out Freud's Freud, because for Freud, uh, uh, human activity is determined by what he calls genitality, sexuality, whereas in Joyce, all the organs of the body, the lungs, the brain, the uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, the liver, the spleen, the stomach in this chapter, uh, and the genitals play into the mind and influence it. So let me just go back over some of the, uh, the passages I read you and notice that they're in fact uh, bearing on food. Uh, why after all does Bloom sympathize with Mrs. Purefoy, the pregnant woman, except that uh, it, it, he's helped to sympathize because he's got pains in his stomach too. Uh, uh, not labor pains, but hunger pains. And um, oh, the nuns that he thinks about. Uh, I'm not going to do this with all the passages. You can do it on yourself. But uh, uh, the nun uh, on page 155, uh, glad to communicate with the outside world. Our great day, she said, feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Sweet name, too, Caramel. And then he goes to think about what nuns eat. Uh, and he thinks at one point about police uh, attacking mobs of rotting students. And he thinks about the police egging raw, raw youths on and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, one way of reading this chapter is just go, th go through it and see how many puns you can find on, on uh, foodstuffs. So in, uh, th the moments that Bluma uh, recalls with Molly, too, are all, it turns out, framed in food. Uh, so if we look at the uh, Glen Creek dinner on page 155, which I read to you, uh, uh, she didn't like it because I sprained my ankle first day she wore a choir picnic at the Sugarloaf. Sugarloaf is a mountain south of Dublin, but of course it functions as a food term here. Um, picnic at Sugarloaf, as if that old Goodwin's tall hat done up with some sticky stuff. Flies picnic too. Flies have to eat. Um, never put a dress on her back like it. Fit her like a glove, shoulder and hips. Just beginning to plump it out well. Rabbit pie we had that day. People looking after her. Mmm, rabbit pie. Um, and on the next page, uh, coming home from the concert, uh, remember when we got home raking up the fire and frying up those pieces of lap of mutton for the supper with the chutney sauce you liked and the mulled rum, uh, more food. And then th that amazing passage on page 176 where Bloom remembers the day they got married. Um, Ravished over her I lay, full lips full open, kissed her mouth, yum. Softly she gave me in my mouth the seed cake warm and chewed. Mawkish pulp her mouth had mumbled sweet and sour with spittle. Joy, I ate it, joy. Young life, her lips that gave me pouting, soft, warm, sticky, gum jelly lips. Um, that's about as close to another person as you can get, you know? Uh, having them chew, the, chew your food for you and then, and then uh, insert it into your mouth the way mother birds do to baby boo birds. Uh, uh, it suggests that hunger uh, it comes to mean something more than just physical hunger in this, uh, this chapter and that uh, um, hunger can be used to uh, 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 
express sexuality to. There, there are two references in this chapter to the breast. Uh, one on page 161 when Bloom is thinking about Mrs. Purefoy giving birth to infants. And uh, um, uh, it also thinks about Molly uh, giving uh, her breast to her children. And then the passage I just read you uh, where Bloom uh, kisses Molly's breasts. Um, the breast is our first source of food and our place of contact with the world. It's the place where we come in contact with mother. A mother. The Latin word for mother um, it comes from an Indo-European root of the same form. And it also gives us the word matter. Like w- in the first nine months of your life, you're embedded in mother, and, and every, every month after that, you're embedded in matter. You depend on matter as you depend on mother. Uh, and I think Joyce is showing us something of uh, uh, our dependency on uh, things that are otherwise repressed in the novel, uh, and things that are gendered feminine, like food and eating. Let's also note, note that, uh, uh, no, actually, I want to go to a famous passage on page 168. Uh, the, uh, the four-line paragraph at the bottom of the page, the three-line paragraph at the bottom of the page, a warm human plumpness settled down in his brain. His brain yielded. Perfume of embraces all him assailed. With hungered flesh obscurely, he mutely craved to adore. Duke Street, here we are, must eat. The Burton, feel better then. So uh, there's, there's a famous story about this paragraph. A friend of Joyce ran across him sitting on a bench in Paris and said, geez, you look exhausted. Uh, and Joyce said, I am. I've been working all day. Uh, I've been writing. And the friend said, uh, uh, you must have gotten a lot done. And Joyce said, well, no, I only wrote two sentences. And I had all the words yesterday. Today I was just figuring out how to arrange them. Uh, these are the two sentences. <laughs> um, but I think what they're showing us is that, that hunger can kind of be, sub- sexuality can be sublimated in hunger. And you, you probably know some people who uh, use food as a, a replacement for uh, other kinds of sensual relation. Or other people who like eat a lot of food in order to build up a kind of fatty bar- body armor that ensures other people stay away. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, food can be used as a weapon, too. Um, the chapter gets us to think about that in ways I'm not going to have time to explore. Uh, but because it's about the subliminal impact of uh, hunger on the brain, it becomes a kind of encyclopedic meditation on the subject uh, um, uh, <coughs> in many ways. Uh, the chapter d- detailing, for instance, suggests that uh, hunger uh, could be regarded as a motivational force of world history. Marx tells us to think about history being propelled by these large economic forces and class, w- class struggles. Freud tells us to think about uh, uh, our lives being governed by the play of sexual forces. Uh, we might think about the role of hunger in uh, motivating people's lives and determining the shape of culture and civilizations. Uh, uh, on page 180, uh, Bloom passes a bookstore, a Protestant bookstore. Um, <coughs> Mr. Bloom turned at Gray's confectioner window of unbarred tarts and passed the Reverend Thomas Connellan's bookstore while he left the Church of Rome, Bird's Nest, Women Run Him. They say they used to give pauper children soup to change to Protestants in the time of the potato blight society over the way Papa went for the conversion of poor Jews, same bait. Um, so Bloom is the, uh, thinking here of the Irish famine, uh, which uh, 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 took, took the Irish population and halved it in the 1840s. And he's also recalling some episodes from the cultural history of Ireland when Protestants would give a Catholic soup or a sandwich if they would convert to Protestantism. So food can change people's minds. It can convert people to other religions. And then interestingly, at the top of page um, um, 172, um, second line, peace and war depend, uh, actually I'll start reading at the bottom of page uh, 171, uh, with kosher. Uh, no meat and milk together. Hygiene, that was what they call now. Yom Kippur, fast spring cleaning of inside. Peace and war depend on some fellow's digestion. Religions, Tur- Christmas turkeys and geese, slaughter of innocents, eat, drink, and be merry, then casual words full after. Heads bandage, cheese digests all but itself, mighty cheese. That line, peace and war depend upon fen- sel- some fellow's digestion. How often has famine uh, or the lack of food caused people to pick up and migrate and get into collisions and and, and wars with other people? Uh, uh, Hunger uh, has been a a, a motivating force of a lot of of world movement. And in Bloom's thoughts about uh, uh, kosher here, uh, you can't eat meat and milk together if you follow a kosher regimen or eat shellfish. Uh, He thinks about it as being hygiene and suggests maybe that the books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy where kosher laws are laid out are, are maybe a kind of desert survival manual. But if you're living in a desert, in a hot climate, it makes sense you don't want to eat um, meat and milk or, or shellfish because they spoil easily and cause disease. And that opens up the chapter uh, to a perspective that allows us to see it as a, 
a kind of exploration of uh, dietary regimes and habits. Uh, and at this point, it gets very interesting. I'm going to go back to that line, eat or be eaten, kill, kill, uh, which Bloom thinks about when he goes into the restaurant, to the first restaurant he goes in. Eat or be eaten, kill, kill, which rhymes for me with a line I read you on page 151. God wants blood victim. His slow feet walk to riverward, walking. Uh, are you saved? All are washed in the blood of the Lamb. God wants blood victim. But the immediate reference is that it used to be a kind of common practice when you were uh, building a building to pour some blood into the foundation stone, a kind of folkloristic superstition. But that line, uh, God wants a blood victim, so do we all. Um, uh, 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 think about the things you eat and uh, uh, try to think about something you eat that is not dead, um, uh, that is n has not been killed. You don't hear the vegetables screaming when you pull them up out of the ground, but they die. They die for you. Um, <coughs> and so uh, 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 this, this, uh, this, this uh, chapter for me becomes a kind of secular revision of the books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy and also Acts of the Apostles where God tells Christians it's okay to have ham. So consider the range of possibilities you have as uh, uh, people with appetites. Um, we've looked at what the gods eat. Um, when Bloom thinks of the statues, nectar, imagine it drinking electricity. Um, uh, uh, and they have no, no anuses, and so they don't have to have like material food. So that's one range of eating that's beyond our, our capability. But check out the uh, eating uh, activity on page 179. At Duke Lane, a ravenous terrier choked up a sick knuckly cud on the cobblestones and lapped it with new zest. Sir Feet returned with thanks, having fully digested the contents. First sweet, then savory, uh, Mr. Bloom coasted warily ruminants, his second course. So at two extremes, you've got the gods eating electricity and the dogs eating vomit. Um, there are people who do that these days. I, I ran across like an avant-garde website, uh, uh, Ubu Web, I think it's called, where there are people who now, nowadays will like force themselves to vomit and then eat it with spoons and then vomit. Uh, you, you, it's out there for you to enjoy uh, if you want to. So uh, we've, we've got uh, uh, the, the dog at one extreme and the, the gods at the other. What about eating meat, uh, meat eaters? Uh, Bloom thinks about the cops eating meat and potatoes and, and uh, therefore not having very developed brains. Uh, but he, the first restaurant he walks into, he sees all these guys eating with their mouths open and decides uh, he doesn't want to eat there. And he also thinks about the, uh, the food they're eating, corned beef and cabbage. Uh, um, the very first paragraph on 171. After all, there's a lot in that vegetarian, fine flavor of things from the earth, garlic, of course. It stinks, Italian organ grinders, crisp of onions, mushrooms, truffles. Pain to animal, too. Pluck and draw fowl. Wretched brutes there at the cattle market waiting for the poleaxe to split their skulls open. Meh. Poor trembling calves. Meh. Staggering bob. Bubble and squeak. Butcher buckets wobble lights. Give us that brisket off the hook. Plop. Raw head and bloody bones. Flayed glass-eyed sheep hung with their, from their haunches. Sneeps, sheep snouts, bloody papered, sniveling nose jam on sawdust. Top and lashers going out. Don't maul them pieces, young one. Hot, fresh bread they prescribe for decline. Blood always needed, insidious, lick it up, smoking hot, sh thick, sugary, famished ghosts. Um, so uh, the, the paint of the animal that Bloom thinks about here, uh, uh, I'm sure you've all read about like uh, slaughterhouses. Uh, if, if you took a contemporary novel with me last year and got to, you got to read about slaughterhouses in Chicago and pensions against the day. I had a, my brother-in-law has a brother who worked in a slaughterhouse in Chicago for a week. Um, his job was, uh, t his cattle would come down a corral and he had a sledgehammer and his job was to like to uh, kill them by burning them right between the two eyes. He lasted a week, which is about the longevity for that job. Um, but think about this the next time you enjoy a steak. You don't have to eat steaks. You can eat veg vegetarian food, as Bloom thinks when he sees the poets coming out of the vegetarian restaurant on uh, page 165. Um, last paragraph. His eyes follow the high figure in homespun, beard and bicycle, a listening woman at his side, coming from the vegetarian. Only vegetables and fruit. Don't eat a beefsteak. If you do, the eyes of that cow will pursue you through all eternity. They say it's healthier. Wind and watery, though. Tried it. Keep you on the run all day. Bad as a bloater. Dream all night. What do they call that thing they gave me? Nut steak. Uh, nutarians, fruitarians. To give you the idea, you're eating rump steak. Absurd. Salted, too. They cook in soda. Keep you sitting by the tap all night. Then he looks at the female poet. Her stockings are loose over her ankles. I detest that. So tasteless. Um, <coughs> and then he goes on to think, I wouldn't be surprised if it was the kind of food you see producers the like waves the brain the poetical. For example, one of those uh, policemen sweating Irish stew into their shirts, you couldn't squeeze a line of poetry out of him. So I wouldn't be surprised if it was the kind of food you see producers the like the waves the brain the poetical. My thinking is the product of food. Um, 
uh, every day all of us eat protein, um, which is related to the word protein, protein, because no matter what you eat, uh, uh, you, you put it into your mouth, it will turn into fingernails, your foot, your head, your ears, your hair, or your thoughts, uh, or your voice. Uh, food is the building block of the body. Um, <coughs> So, uh, again, uh, it's, it's amazing the number of things that people eat, and if this chapter starts getting you to explore. Uh, there's a reference to nutarians and fruitarians in the paragraph I just read. Uh, do you all know about those? Um, there are people who only eat nuts and fruits because you don't have to kill them. You can wait for them to drop. Um, this may be the most humane dietary regimen. And it says something, of course, about Bloom, that he walks the golden mean and doesn't eat meat or vegetable, but a cheese sandwich. Uh, you don't have to kill anything to eat cheese. You just take it away from its mom. Um, <coughs> But uh, think about the things that people have uh, decided to eat, uh, as Bloom does on page 174, last paragraph. Um, Mild fire of wine kindles his veins. I wanted that badly. Felt so off color. His eyes unhungrily saw shelves of tins, sardines, gaudy lobsters, claws. All the odd things people pick up for food. Out of shells, periwinkles with pin, off trees, snails on the ground the French eat, out of the sea with bait on a hook. Silly fish learn nothing in a thousand years. If you didn't know, risky putting anything in your mouth. Poisonous berries. Roundness you think good. Gaudy color warns you off. One fellow told another and so on. Try it on the dog first. <laughs> Let on by the smell or the look. Uh, you think about it. Uh, uh, who discovered how to eat like uh, shellfish or oysters or uh, artichokes? Um, the, I'm a New Yorker. The first uh, uh, month I got to California in 1970, somebody fed me an artichoke, which we didn't have on the East Coast. and I started eating the whole thing uh, uh, until they told me that wasn't the way you did it. Uh, but who, dis who discovered how to do that? And as Bloom thinks on page 179, who distilled first? These people are great contributors to our culture. They've, gi they've given us things that maybe uh, are, are, are more important to us than uh, the collected work of John Milton, uh, artichokes and oysters, uh, great contr cultural contributions that we tend not to think about. Um, so uh, think about uh, the relativity of cuisine. On another level, uh, uh, the, the range of things that people eat, Bloom explores on page 171. Uh, I'm going to start out with, uh, not 171, 175. About seven lines down. That Archduke Leopold, was it? No, yes, or was it Otto, one of those Habsburgs? Or who was it used to eat the scruff up of his own head? <laughs> Cheapest lunch in town. Um, so now you can, um, you, you can think about all the people you know who eat body parts, fingernails, uh, scruff on the top of their head. Uh, the list goes, quite a menu there of, of available things. And then he also thinks on this page of the rich, uh, what the rich eat. Um, uh, uh, the, the elite, creme de la creme, they want special dishes to pretend they're hermit with a platter of pulse, royal sturgeon, uh, venison, and so on and so forth. And then also uh, the relativity of cuisine. He thinks at the top of this page about the Chinese eating eggs 50 years old, blue and green again. Dinner of 30 courses, each dish harmless, must mix inside idea for a poison mystery. And I'm sure you've all explored uh, uh, the cuisine of uh, uh, non-Western cultures and, and discovered some very bizarre things to eat. Uh, in Mexico, live insects. Uh, and uh, I was once offered a Philippine dish called balot, which is a hard-boiled egg in which there's the skeleton of the fetal chicken. So you get a crunch when you eat it. Um, I pass that up. Um, uh, but cuisines vary from uh, culture to culture. And then there's fast food. Uh, uh, they had fast food in, in 1904, too, uh, junk food. Uh, Bloom sees an advertisement for something called Plum Tree's Potted Meat. Uh, it's like a spam, a scam, spam product on page uh, 171. Very last uh, paragraph. Uh, uh, he's just had a sandwich and uh, thinks about sardines on shelves, uh, almost tastes them by looking. Sandwich, uh, ham and his descendants, mustard and bread there. Potted meats. What is a home without plum trees? Potted meat. Incomplete. What a stupid ad. Out of the obituary notices, they stuck it up. All up a plum tree. Dignam's potted meat. Cannibals wood with lemon and rice. White missionary too salty like pickled pork. Expect the chief consumes the parts of honor. Ought to be tough from exercise. His wives in a row to watch the effort effect. There was a right royal old nigger who ate the something of the Reverend McTrigger. His 900 lives had the time of their lives. It got bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and then he goes on. Uh, With it in a boat of bliss, Lord knows what concoction. Calls, moldy tripes, windpipes, fakes, and minced up. Puzzle, find the meat. Okay, I'm going to segue into the Big Mac, 100% beef. Um, does it taste anything like cut of sirloin? Um, when they say 100% beef, what do you think you're getting? 
I saw a, a feature on TV that uh, talked about McDonald's as the world's biggest consumer of cattle eyeballs. Um, the, the Big Mac is beef, but it's probably like tails, snouts, ears, eyes, penises. Uh, it, it's not the sirloin part of the meat you get. So uh, think about that when you have a big meat, uh, Big Mac. Uh, and um, additives. Uh, as Bloom is crossing the River Liffey on page 152, it's when he thinks about the taste of the Liffey. Uh, be interesting to get a pass. He sees a, 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 a barge going down the Liffey carrying Guinnesses. Uh, be interesting someday to get a pass through Hancock to see the brewery. Regular Wilden itself. Bat supporter. Wonderful. Rats get in too. Drink themselves bloated as big as a collie floating. Dead drunk on the porter. Drink it till they puke like Christians. Imagine drinking that. Rats, bats. Well, of course, if we know all the things. Uh, anybody work in the food industry and have like horror stories to tell about what goes into the food that's served to the public? Uh, or has anybody read the, uh, uh, the Food and Drug Administration's guidelines on what's allowable in, in, in food that's marketed to the public? Uh, you're allowed to have a certain number of insects and a certain number of uh, rat turds and, and uh, insects. Uh, uh, there are regulations. Uh, but the only way to make sure you're getting uh, good, clean food is to make it yourself. <laughs> So I'm going to drop the uh, attention to uh, uh, the, the range of things that Joyce looks at in this chapter. And notice also it's not simply food as an object, uh, but the way that, people, the way that people eat becomes a kind of study here. You've got the slobs in the Burton Hotel that cause Bloom to back out because they're talking with their mouths full and like uh, dribbling on themselves. And at the end of the chapter when Bloom helps the blind stripling cross the street, he knows there's slobbered food all over the front of his shirt. Some people uh, eat that way. I kind of do. Um, on page 161, he thinks about me, Mrs. Purefoy's uh, husband. They're Methodists. Uh, poor Mrs. Purefoy, Methodist husband, method in his madness, saffron bun and milk and soda lunch in the educational dairy, eating with a stopwatch, 32 chews to the minute. Still his mutton chop whiskers grew. So uh, there, there are uh, books and articles you can read that will tell you like how many times you're supposed to chew to maximize the, your, the nutritional, your nutrition you get out of food. And I've got a copy of an article in the flyleaf of my book here just published last year that talks about the, the length of time you take to eat uh, has an effect on your weight. If you eat fast, you tend to get heavier more quickly. So eating slower is a, a way of, uh, of dieting. Uh, there are all kinds of advice on like how you should eat. Uh, there's also the square meal, which the Methodist uh, method of eating reminds me of. Uh, if you're the son or daughter of somebody in the military, you, you may have been trained to eat uh, with military rigor. Uh, and then, of course, there's uh, uh, Nosy Flynn, whose uh, nose uh, drops, uh, drops are falling out of his nose into his food and doesn't face him. And on 154, we've got the uh, sandwich board men walking down the street, uh, eating while they're walking. It's like adolescence in Berkeley. Uh, you get to be 16 in Berkeley, and these triangular slices of pizza get affixed to your chin. Uh, but some people walk, uh, eat, walk and eat at the same time. Uh, I don't do that. I like to sit down when I eat. Uh, and... Uh, also, food is, uh, 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 go back to that line, eat pig like pig. Food is an index to character. And there are various points in the chapter where Bloom associates people to what they eat. So we go back to that paragraph about Billy Dedalus, uh, uh, potatoes and Marge, Marge and potatoes, that child's uh, uh, underfed. She's on, uh, it's the potato chip diet of eating like just a lot of starch. Um, the Dan White diet of 1904. You all know about Dan White, the guy who shot Mayor Moscone and Harvey Milk? Uh, when he was uh, on trial for murder, his defense was that uh, he was unhinged because he ate nothing but Hostess Twinkies for a month, and it, it put him off. Uh, the Twinkies defense, very famous. Uh, well, I assume if you, if you eat Twinkies for a month, your, your thinking's not going to be entirely straight. Uh, and then on page 174, 175, Bloom remembers that Blazes Boylan has come out of the Red Bank uh, restaurant which served oysters. Oysters, of course, are aphrodisiacal, but Bloom also thinks that oysters eat sewage, as they do. I had a, a scientist friend, uh, a malaria expert, who uh, wouldn't, wouldn't eat oysters because she said it was like, playing Russian, Russian roulette, you get the wrong uh, oyster and you die. I think the risk is worth it. Uh, uh, and then, you have, of course, you have the vegetarians producing poetry. And let me leave you off with uh, uh, some reflections on what Joyce said in his schema was the art of the chapter, architecture. How do we get there? Well, God wants a blood victim. Uh, blood goes into the foundation stone of a building. And there are lots of descriptions of, like, the, uh, uh, the, street, the, the street front of uh, Dublin on page... Uh, 183, as Bloom is going to the libra library and museum, he thinks what a handsome building it is. Uh, um, elsewhere, he thinks about how uh, uh, the city is constantly uh, uh, filled with renters who come and go. Uh, and uh, the significance of the architecture for me was revealed by the Wonder Bread uh, commercial. Wonder Bread helps build strong bodies 12 different ways. Or by a New Testament verse, uh, Jesus says, destroy this temple and in three days I will build it up. Uh, you can wreck your body, uh, run it into the ground. 
uh, you put good food into it, and uh, you can build it up from scratch. Now, uh, it happens that, uh, so, so uh, food is the building block of the body, and the body is the building block of the city. Uh, food is at the bottom of the, of the uh, architecting process of the city. Th three times in the chapter, we're told that the Dublin Corporation is having a meeting today. Corporation comes from the Latin word corpus, meaning, uh, meaning body. And I need chalk for this last part. Uh, I gave you a map. Uh, did anybody follow it? What did you find? Did you find any pattern? Okay. Bloom starts out at the candy store, walks down O'Connell Street, over the bridge to Grafton Street. About here he meets Mrs. Breen, has his conversation. Uh, he walks further down Grafton Street and looks at in the windows of these department stores and thinks about buying Molly some lingerie. Then he goes into uh, Duke, Duke Street and goes to the Burton Hotel, uh, sees these guys eating like slobs, decides he doesn't want to eat there, and so he goes back to Davy Burns, has his gorgonzola cheese sandwich, and then leaves. At about this point, uh, one of the characters, Tom Roachford, has dyspepsia. Uh, at this point, Bloom sees the dog throwing up a uh, six nut cut and lopping it up again. Over here, he stands in front of the, 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 the store window of a plumber and looks at toilet bowls. And uh, here he helps the blind stripling cross the street, and here he meets Boylan. So does that evoke anything? It's like the giant Lestragonian. Uh, with Bloom meeting Boylan right at, the, at, at, at this uh, uh, very foul spot. Uh, uh, and there's a sentence in the chapter where Bloom says, uh, uh, I feel like I've been eaten and spewed. Uh, so we're meant to see him going through the body of a giant cannibal Lestragonian. Oh, and I forgot to tell you in that passage about the limerick, uh, uh, the cannibals, uh, people, there are people who eat people. And uh, the part that they're eating is the penis, because there are people who eat those things, too. We're getting into Jeffrey Dahmer terrain here. Um, so uh, uh, let me just close by suggesting that uh, 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 the, uh, the chapter is showing us our immense dependency on matter and on food and making us aware of things of which we're unconscious. Uh, do you know what any, char any character we've read about eats? Uh, uh, the Captain of the Secret Chair, uh, John Marker, uh, do they eat food? Uh, and uh, uh, it's because we're our dependency on food, but also, uh, uh, as Freud reminds us, that our, our the process of eating and alimentation has given us a lot of ways of thinking about the way that we think, and that thinking may actually be a kind of form of digestion. Uh, Jacques Derrida has an essay called Economimesis, where he talks about learning as a kind of process of digestion. In, in the classical view of learning, uh, sense impressions come into your head and make dings, impressions in your head, and, and, and you've got this, in, this knowledge that you can jockey around, but all of us know the experience of learning something often means taking something in and gradually letting it assimilate and become part of your body. It's incorporated, as Freud says, uh, says, or interjected. It becomes part of you uh, slowly by a process of digestion. And just think of all the expressions uh, we use uh, that are based on food. Uh, I can't swallow that. I find it distasteful or disgusting. It makes me fret, from the German fretten, meaning to eat. Uh, um, let's chew the cud, let's chew the fat, um, let's ruminate, and so on and so forth. Um, um, okay, uh, I'll leave you at that. Uh, Monday we'll start Faulkner. <laughs>